What is the day? Say, as you see the day approaching. What day is Paul talking about? What is he talking about? What day is he referring to here? The day of judgment. Now, the day of judgment, is this something that we... Christ said we know not the day, not the hour. So how can we see this day coming? If we don't know, how can we know it's near that it's coming? Okay. 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 But there have always been wars, though. Okay. Okay. So, to me, okay, that is the point I'm looking for. So, we should always. Today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. So, Christ may come any moment. So, when somebody look at this and say, well, he's asking us to do this when we see the day approaching. Yes, he said we should do it, but we should pay more attention to this, even as we see the day approaching. But we have said there that even from when Christ said it, the signs has been there that it could be tomorrow. No man knows the day nor the hour. So what this is telling us is to be on guard always because it could be any time. So when we talk about not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, even as we see the day approaching, so we should not wait until we say, oh, when I was younger, I thought it was going to be, um, I, oh, maybe I have a measure of it until I begin to appreciate how long it's going to be. Until I begin to appreciate that it's going to be in 10 years' time. So I'm going to wait until I'm getting closer, maybe it's the five years that before I begin to follow this. No, because nobody knows the day nor the hour. So what this tells me is for us to be ready because it could be any time. So when it comes to this having fellowship or not forsaking one another, it's something that we must do always. It's something we are, that we must do always. Before we go into this some more, I want us to quickly look at 1 Peter. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5, 8. Talking about our adversary, the devil. Yes. Be so. For a be so be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a warring lion, walking the ground, seeking me in the devil. Praise the Lord. He said, be ye sober, be ye vigilant, because your enemy, the devil, like a royal lion, is looking for whom to devour. Is looking for whom to devour. Now, if we look at this, will it be easier if you look at a sheep? Or if we look at um, um, a sheep? Will it be easier for the lion to get a sheep that is solitary, that is by itself? Or compared to a sheep that is in the head with, when there are multitude? So when you look at it, a solitary sheep, a lonely sheep, is an easy prey for the lion. It's easier to get, it's easier for the lion to get. But when you have heads of sheep, you have multitude of them, yes, the lion could also say, okay, where they are gathered also, when you have multitude of them, chances are that the shepherd is going to be there. Chances are that somebody is there taking care of them. So even when the sheep cannot defend themselves by their shared number, but because they are together, and because of the possibility of the shepherd being there watching over them, the chances of the lion coming there and taking a prey out of that head is, is slimmer than uh, a sheep. A sheep stands a better chance being with the flock 
than being alone. Praise the Lord. So if we know this, that the, 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 our, we have an enemy that the Bible says is looking, is going up and down. And his purpose of going up and down is to get whom he would devour. Is to get that that he will catch as prey. Is to get that that he will subdue. Is to get that that he will overpower. So for me, I think it would make a better sense if I stay with the multitude. Because anyone that is out by himself, that is standing alone by himself, stands no chance with the lion. It becomes an easy target. It becomes an easy prey. It becomes an easy catch for the lion. But also, when I have it at the back of my mind, that where these sheep are gathered, the chances of the shepherd being there. And we also know, the word of God tells us that where two or three are gathered, he is there in their midst. He is there in their presence. So that assurance of that protection is enough to move any man. It's enough to move any woman to want to be with fellow-minded Christians. Because the protection of the shepherd is guaranteed. I pray the Lord give us understanding in Jesus' name. So we are going to look at why the church attendance is very important for a Christian. And if we go through the, 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 the introduction here, it says in the Bible, God has always had a pattern for his people. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle was a prophetic picture of God's intent to dwell in his people. God's presence uniquely dwelt in the tabernacles. In the New Testament, Christ confirmed he would build his church, as we see in Ephesians 5.25. And later, Paul tells us to meet as believers and to encourage one another. So when we meet, it's for our own benefit. It's for our own benefit, especially giving the assurance that our Lord and Master, our Protector, our, our, our Shield, promised that when two or three of us are gathered, that he will be present. Knowing that the enemy is going up and down. Knowing that the enemy is going up and down, looking for whom he will get as prey. But there is the other end of it where security and protection is guaranteed. So a wise Christian will want to take advantage of that protection. A wise Christian will want to take advantage of that protection. So we are going to look at some of the um, reasons why it is important for Christians to stay together. Now, the one thing that I started with was... Um, uh, when we say church, when we say the concept of church, is it the physical building? Or what, when we say attending church or being together, does it mean that it has to be in a physical building alone? Or is there something that divides church beside the building? Beside the building. Because when Christ said, when he talked to Peter, and he called Peter that on this rock I will build my church. So did Peter become a physical rock? Did he become a physical rock? So when, when that pastor said on this I will build my church, what was he talking about? What was he talking about? So we have to understand that to understand what the church is all about. So the church is not just the building. Yeah, the physical building is good. Because it creates and it gives us a common point of congregation. It gives us a common point where we come together. But the church is more than a building. Because if we look at that promise of, the, of, of, of wherever two minds of similar mind that is focused on the purpose of lifting the name of God up, where they gathered, where they agree concerning something, where they agree concerning a thing, and they decide to walk in unity, that becomes a church. They don't have to be physically present. 
They don't have to be in a physical building together in the same place. A Christian here in the United States and a Christian in Japan, for example, belong to the same church, which is what? The body of Christ. The body of Christ. So when we are talking about the importance of attending the church, yet the physical building like we do every time we have this activity here is important, but also having agreement, having a meeting of the mind with fellow Christians, no matter where they are. Praise the Lord. So not forsaking the interaction the communication, the engagement with people of like mind as it pertains to the thing of God. So somebody that decides to say, well, the only way I can, I can come to church as a, uh, is, is the only way I cannot forget, for, forsake the assembly of the saint of ourselves together is to come to a church. Does it mean when I only come to church for those that come to church only on Sunday? So from the other Sunday to the end of the, way, of the, of the week, they are forsaking the assembly of, of themselves with others? No, it shouldn't be. So long as this person has interaction, we have to the glory of God, especially with this advent of technology. We have various ways that we can use to engage with one another. We have various ways. Phone calls, emails, visit, physical visit. Or different things that we do to engage, so long as the purpose of that engagement is centered around Christ, then that engagement or that interaction becomes a church. I pray the Lord give us understanding in Jesus' name. So if we look at some of the vital reasons of the, the importance of attending a church, it said the church is called the body. Every believer around the world, like I said, regardless of their denomination, is part of the body of Christ. Is part of the body of Christ. The physical building as a point of agreement, as a point of commonality that, okay, if we want to come together and come under one roof, we don't have to say, okay, today come to my house, tomorrow I come to your house. Or the, today we meet in a mall, the following day we meet in a park. It is good to have that physical structure that we come around and say we're going to use for this activity that we agree on concerning with our mind. It is good. The physical building is okay. But the important thing is to have that agreement of mind. Once that agreement of mind is there, wherever you meet, that agreement of mind by itself becomes the church. So you can now move and take the church wherever you want to take it. Praise the Lord. You cannot take the church wherever you want to take it because the body of Christ is universal. It's for us to agree and accept that Christ is Lord. It is through him that we can obtain salvation. Once we agree on that, then we belong to that body. May the Lord give us understanding in Jesus' name. He said, as a member of the body of Christ, we belong to each other. Christians are made together. Christians are made together. We, the Christians, we are the church. Let us look at Romans 12, verse 5. Romans 12, 5. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we be many, we are one in Christ. And every one member, one of another. Despite we may be many, despite I may be in the United States, another person is in Canada. Another is in Japan. So long as we have a common focus, so long as we have a common belief, 
So long as we trust in this same God, is Paul is telling us here that we are one. We all belong to each other. The body of the Christian here should be the body of the Christian in, in Japan. The joy of the Christian here should be the joy because when the body functions together, what affects one part affects the other. But unfortunately, we are beginning to see the reverse these days. We are people begin to say, well, it doesn't bother me what happened to me so long as I'm okay. So long as it does not affect my family, I'm okay. Praise the Lord. In the actual sense, we should see ourselves as one. We should see ourselves as one. We should see ourselves as belonging to each other. We should see ourselves as we are together and treat ourselves as such. So long as the common thing, the other that is common to us is our faith and our belief in this God. He said the church is a family. It is a spiritual family. God expects me to be a member of a family. As we see in Ephesians 2 verse 19, which tells us that we are the household of God. Now, when it comes to this belief, it is not optional. I cannot say I trust in God or I believe in God, then, but I don't want anything to do with any Christian. Or I don't want anything to do with that believer that also believes. Except that belief is not on the same God that I believe in. If it is in the same God that I claim to believe in, then we should have a common thing that we want to have, make us have this interaction. We should have a common interest. We should have a common interest. Because when we work it together, when we bring this, our common interest together, we will find out that we will enjoy each other. Actually, we will enjoy believing in this God. We remember the, the, the apostles. We remember what happened. The Bible recorded the greatest thing that would have happened. The man, the Lord, Savior that they've always known, the Messiah, the miracle worker, their teacher, the one that was all today, the one that gave, they gave everything up for, to follow. Men took him. They saw him. He was beaten. He was crucified. He died. He died at the point they gave up. Oh, he's dead. Oh, if he was this strong, why couldn't he deliver himself? But he has a purpose. He has a mission. But to the glory of God, the Bible said death could not hold him bound. On the third day, he rose again. And this Messiah that they believed that was going to bring salvation, that was going to bring heaven to them, they saw him taken away. He was gone. He was gone. But because of that common belief, they were able to stay together. The Bible said they were in one accord. They agreed. They agreed in this power and this second coming of the Lord. They agreed in his promises that when he said, I am going away, but I will send you a comforter. They agreed. Because they have a common hope, because they have a common belief, and we saw what happened. When ordinarily, we know what happened when a man's hope is dashed. When a man's hope must believe on, any, on something. And that thing is not coming to pass. Or somebody, you invest so much in the stock market and you are expecting, okay, maybe by the time I turn 45, I'm going to make it big and, and it doesn't come to pass. We know what it would do. When hope are dashed, we know what happened. We know what happened, how frustrating it could be. But to the glory of God, the disciples, they had something so strong that they believed in, and they were able to hold it together. And we know what happened when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. And that is the fruit that you and I we are enjoying today. So when that time came, the power of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, the lion that is roaring could not stop them. The power that was able to capture their master, that was meant to drive fear in them, that was executed publicly, 
for everyone to say so that this fear will be driven to this disciple. That fear that came upon them when the Holy Spirit came, that fear was gone. Why? Because they believed and they decided to, 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 to stay together. They decided to see themselves as one. The Bible said they were of one accord. They don't, it's not like I am going to do this. No, everybody agreed this is what we are going to do. This is what our faith is all about. This is how we are going to do it. And by that, and through that, the Spirit of God was being manifest. And the glory of God was revealed amongst men. That no power could stop. That no power could hold back. And the Bible recorded that it was so powerful that when they spoke, people that could not hear what they were, but yet they understood what they were saying. And they begin to wonder, are these not these people? Are these not the tribe? Are these not the people that I know speak this tribe? But yet they speak and I hear them. I am not supposed to hear them. That is the power of staying together. That is what the power of staying together can do. They stay together. They did not forget the assemblies of one another. And they, because they believe in the power of Christ, and great things was wrought among them. I pray the Lord give us understanding in Jesus' name. He said you need to be a part of a local church family. You cannot be the church if you do not go to the church. You cannot be the church if we do not go to church. You cannot say I am a member of this when you are not a member. For you to say I belong to, you must practice the characteristics you must have in you, the behavior, the, the features of that entity that you say you belong to. Praise the Lord. So you cannot say, I am a member of the global church or the body of Christ when you don't do what will make you or practice what will identify you as a member. A Christian without a family, without a church family, is a, she is a sheep without a shepherd. And that is how I started this analogy. A Christian that is alone, the one that says, oh, so long as I believe in Christ, all I need to do is to believe. All I, my belief is not in man, it's in God. So I don't care about what he believes or what the other believes, so long as I know what I believe. When such a Christian is in trouble, when such a Christian needs somebody to hold his hand to pray. When such a Christian comes, when the, when the lion, when the, when, the, when the adversary that is going up and down, come to that individual, and they need somebody to say, what do I do here? They will have nobody to encourage them. It will be like a solitary ship that is by itself that will become an easy prey for the lion. I pray that will not be our testimony in Jesus' name. He said, a church is the best place to manifest your spiritual gift. We are talking of some of the uh, why church attendance is, is important or vital for a Christian life. I have a gift. I have something that God has deposited in me. We are all made uniquely. We are all made with a different or a unique talent gift or whatever God has put in us. If I decide not to be part of the body of Christ, where will I manifest that gift? Where will I manifest that gift? Am I going to use it to glorify other things? The best place to be is for me to belong to a church. A church as a physical church as well as a spiritual church. Where this gift that the Lord has given me, I will be able to use it to build up the church of God. He said the church is a community. It's worshipping with others, praying for others, hurting with others, serving others, and be involved in the lives of others, like the disciples did in the early days. 
they were together. They bore each other's burden. The Bible recorded that every man sold what they had and they brought it. It became like a common thing. A church uh, or a Christian that wants to be by himself, a Christian that sees himself that all he has or all is entitled is for him and for him alone, is a Christian that is not ready to identify with the body of Christ. And a Christian that is not ready to identify with the body of Christ, tell me what your belief is in. Praise the Lord. That is somebody that does not believe in this Christ. Because if you believe and you tie into the connectivity of other Christians, then you will see yourself as a part of that body. And once you see yourself as a part of that body, then you will come to realize that what you have does not belong to you alone. That whatever the Lord has put into you is for you to serve others. It's for you to be involved in the lives of others. Be each other's body's bearer. Everyone has a purpose in the local church, both corporately, corporately and individually. Everyone has something that another does not have. We are stronger together. We see how the Lord gives to each one diverse ministry, diverse gifts, diverse fruit, all for the edification of the body of Christ. What I have, you may not have it. What you have, I may not have it. Even if you have what I have, it may take you more effort to do it. There are things I can do easily that you may be able to do, but it's going to take you longer to do. There are things that you can do that I may be able to do, but it's going to take me a longer effort to do. So each of all has little part of this whole. There is a part of the whole that belongs that that I am in charge of, that the Lord has deposited in me. There is a part of this whole that the Lord has empowered you to do. If I decide to do it my own, if I decide to do it on my own, I may be able to do it, but it may take me longer time and more effort. Whereas, if we decide to pull these things together, we will discover that if you... Have you seen ants? Have you seen ants? Moving like a crumb or a grain of rice or a crumb of bread. Praise the Lord. You look at the size of the ant. Sometimes, especially when I, I used to take delight in just watching them. Not like here where everybody is. Everywhere is so, what am I looking for now? So organized. So, so, um, so that you don't see them. If you go to camps, you go to parks, just sit down and watch them. No matter how big that crumb that they are trying to move, no matter how big it is, they, they will move it. It might take time. You see this one, they will push this way, you see it will turn around and go to the other, they will begin to get to a point until they can all get to a point that they will be able to roll, and that is how they are going to roll it until they get it to where they want to put it. What, why are they, where are they taking it to their nest? Where are they, what are they taking it for? It's to eat. Praise the Lord. But each one can say, well, the crumb is here. Why don't I just come and, and take my bite here, eat my food, uh, eat my food and go away? Is there anyway? But no, they make up their mind and they decide collectively they are able to move, move it. That should be the mind of Christian. It's not because it shouldn't be because I can do it and I have what it takes to be to, to to live a life that I want. I don't care about my fellow brother. No. Because that guy that you don't care about today may be the one that you need tomorrow. Because God has deposited in that individual what you don't have. I pray the Lord give us understanding in Jesus' name. So everyone has the has a purpose in the local church. Okay, we've gone through that. 
we gather for him, not ourselves. God uses our differences. God uses our differences to people to propel the gospel around the world through our diversity. The strengths and weaknesses of the members of the local church are intentional, but they are even complementary. So when God did not make one person to have it all, when God made it in such a way that I am not the only person that can do this thing, it has a purpose. It has a purpose. And I always say this, if God wants to create an island for each and every one of human being that is on earth today. He could have done it. He had the power to do it. Create an island, put me there to be self, to live by myself and not need anybody. He could have done it. But in his infinite wisdom, he saw it wise not to do that. And he put me in a community and he put in me what I need. And he removed from me some of those things that I need to survive, and he put it in you. So that when you and I come together and exchange what we have, there will be that complete whole. So we are supposed to prepare the gospel of God by our unique and different gift that we have. That thing that makes me unique. And that thing that makes you unique, we are supposed, it's the plan of God that will bring these things together so that we can use it to move the work of God forward. That is why some are apostles, some are evangelists, some are prophets. All these things he gives to individuals so that when they bring all these resources together, you will have a very strong and complete church, which is the body of Christ. So the strength and the weaknesses that he made in us is supposed to complement each other. It's to make, supposed to make us interdependent, that we depend on each other. Oh, we need to do this. I cannot do it. You are better at this. Go and do it. Oh, we need to do this. Okay, this is the area I think I can function where I can do well. We jump in it and we do it. And together we exalt the name of our God. Praise the Lord. He said, we gather because we are one body, drawn together by God to be a people of God who live for God. We disciple others through, through life together. We serve, teach, and encourage one, one another like the church in Corinth did. As we can see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, and 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. The church encouraged each other. Members, church, encourage each other. They serve each other. They teach. We are supposed to be light to each other. Light. So that what I don't see, you see. So that what you don't see, I will see it. And collectively, we'll bring it together and we'll see all around us, 360. I could be the eye to the, to the, to the left and you be the eye to the right. And the other man is the eye to the, to the front and the other one is the eye to the back. At the end of the day, when we decide to walk together, they will become the man that sees three sisters around himself. If I say, well, because I have a neck that I, that I can turn, it may take me time. How many times am I going to turn before I get tired? Whereas if I trust this person enough and we stay together, I don't have to turn. I just focus on the one that I'm doing and I'm able to be effective in that that I'm called to do. And you are able to be effective in that that you are called to do. And at the end of the day, we find out that we are very, very effective working together. The body of Christ is one. The church of Christ is one. And he make us part of that church. He make us part of that body. What he put in me, he did not put in you. What he put in the other person, I don't have it. But when we bring all these things together, the body of Christ will be complete, will be full, will be whole. 
and will be able to show to the world that yes, the church is complete. The body of Christ is strong. The body of Christ can do much. I pray the Lord give us understanding in Jesus' name. Does anybody have any question or something to add to this? Talking about why the importance of attending church, the importance of seeing yourself or seeing ourselves as part of the church. Does anybody have any question or comment? Okay. Amen. So if we look at it, it said when Christ, in conclusion, it said when Christ promised to build his church, he was pledging to bring together a group of people who would gather in one accord to worship God. A group of people that will gather together in an agreement to serve God. You can't be an isolated Christian and expect to fulfill the Great Commission. You cannot be a lone Christian. You cannot do it alone. You cannot do it alone. It is when we bond together. It is when we agree. It is when we work together that we will fulfill the mandate that God has put on us. I pray the Lord help us to receive strength to see in us and see in others around us that, that we need to be effective in the mandate that the Lord has laid in our hand in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we rise to our feet? Can we rise to our feet and just begin to thank God and begin to worship Him because He has done it. He has made a way for us. He has brought us into His throne. He has opened the way for us. Let's go to Him and say, Father, that that I need, O oh Lord, to appreciate that that You have done. Father, Lord, that that I need to appreciate, O oh Lord, my limitation. That that I need, O oh Lord, to appreciate, O oh Lord, that I need my brother, that I need my sister to be effective in my calling. That that I need, O oh Lord, to appreciate who You have and where You have placed me, and those that You have placed around me to help my ministry to help my calling, to help, oh Lord, even to help me in this journey, this race that you have called me to run. Mighty Father, we are here, even as you have instructed us today, that in your church, oh Lord, you intentionally and deliberately make create some great weaknesses and strength in people so that we can complement each other. Father, Lord, the grace, oh Lord, the grace, oh Lord, to realize the uniqueness in me, the grace, oh Lord, to recognize, oh Lord, that that you have put in my brothers and in my sister to complement, oh Lord, that weakness in me. Mighty Father, Lord, I receive. We stand here, precious Father, and receive that grace, oh Lord, that we will see our part, we will see our part in this whole. The grace to play our part, not to fall, not to be the weakest link, precious Father. The grace, oh Lord, not to disappoint your calling upon our life. That 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 you have put in me will not be a waste, precious Father. That 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 you have put Use me to feel that you are you are proposed for me to feel in your house will not be a waste, precious Father. The grace to fulfill and to do that that you have called me to do, mighty Father, we receive. Oh Lord, we receive, precious Father, that even as we have heard your word, let your will be done. Let your word guide us. Let it be a light to our feet, O oh Lord. Let it speak to our heart. Ancient of days, we worship you. Glory and honor to your holy name. Thank you, precious Father. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Can we collect our offering? Can we collect our offering? Glory be to God. Highest. Amen. Glory be to God. In the highest. Amen. For his mercies endure forever. Amen. For his mercies endure forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Highest. Amen. 
Glory be to God in thy highest. Amen. For his mercies endure forever. Amen. For his mercies endure forever. Amen. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Our Lord and our God will bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord, King of Glory, for gathering us together one more time around your table to be fed, O God, with your word. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here tonight to eat from the dining table that you have set before us, even in the presence of our enemy. Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for your son that you have used to teach us tonight. May your strength continue to be revealed in his life in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, King of glory, for you brought us here to be blessed. As we live, Lord, we are not living in your presence. We ask, O oh God, that you will take us to our various destinations safely in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, mighty Father. Thank you, King of glory. We commit the remaining part of this weekend into your hands. Take absolute control, O oh God, and let your name be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Praise God.